I've always been fascinated by the natural world, uh, particularly uh, as a child when I lived in a very natural setting in the eastern part of the United States and could go out and collect butterflies and watch rabbits and all of these sorts of things. But at the age of 13, I read a book called Man's Place in Nature, which was an attempt by Thomas Henry Huxley in the late 1800s to understand uh, our place within the natural world. And of course, today we've moved more and more away from the natural world. We live in cities where people don't even know that cows make the milk. They think it just comes from the shelf. So uh, I think that unfortunately, 21st century humans have forgotten how much a part of nature we really are. Well, I, I had a, a deep interest in human origins beginning when I was a, a young student in high school. And I always wanted to go to Africa and find something. And uh, I had that opportunity in 1970 to travel with my professor from the University of Chicago. And I found that I really loved being in the field. I loved waking up with the sun and going to bed with the sun and spending every day in a natural environment. And in 1974, I was exploring a, a, a new region of the Great Rift Valley that had never been examined for human fossils. And it was a Sunday, November 24th, 1974, and I was out surveying and looking and walking and mapping sites and things, and I, I saw a small piece of bone uh, that was actually the elbow bone. And I looked at it, and it was, it was really, we carry a search image in our minds. So it was like, here was the bone, and here was the bone I had studied somewhere in my mind, and the two of them came together. And I realized right away that this was a bone from a human ancestor. After I was convinced that, that I saw it, I said, this is absolutely from a human ancestor. Then I said, that can't be true. I said, how could this be? How could my childhood dream be at my feet? in all of this area where we were working. So I kneeled down, my student was with me, I kneeled down, I picked it up, and he said to me, he said, how are you so certain that this is from a human skeleton? And next to my left hand was a shard, a piece of skull. And I said, because it's next to these pieces of human skull. And then we looked up the slope and saw part of her jaw. We saw part of her leg. And we knew, I still get goosebumps, I'm still excited about it when I think about it, that there it was, you know, a partial skeleton of an ancestor that was older than three million years. And I, I didn't know who she was. Of course, we didn't know her name. <laughs> that came much later. Um, but I knew that it was old and it was fairly complete and it would be very important. But it took about three years of, of study in the laboratory to really determine that she was a new kind of human, a new Australopithecus alpharensis, a new species, uh, and that she would also demand a redrawing of the family tree. And uh, so it, it came in stages, but at first it was total belief and then total disbelief, and then, oh my gosh, there's a piece of skull. Well, I think what makes Lucy so special to the average person, someone who picks up the morning newspaper and says, oh, they've got a new discovery in Tanzania or a new discovery in Kenya, and it's older than Lucy. Oh, no, that one's younger than Lucy, or it's more complete than Lucy. So she has become the benchmark, the, the touchstone by which other people understand human origins, because if... if if you just called her Australopithecus afarensis, the reaction is, I can't remember that name. It's so complicated and confusing. But a name like Lucy is simple to remember. It's like bringing up the name of a relative, which in fact, she is a relative. Well, this is, this is a very important observation about Lucy and all the fossils that are found. They are links to our past but they're also links to the natural world in which our ancestors lived. Imagine until 12,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, humans all over the planet 
whether they lived in Siberia or South America or the Southwest United States or in Central Europe, they were hunter-gatherers. And their lives were intimately tied. Every day they were in nature. They depended on nature. They depended on surviving by understanding the natural world. Where might those animals be? When do those animals migrate through here? When do those fruits mature and ripen? When can we go out and dig up these kinds of roots? We were so tied and interdependent with the natural world, and we were in much smaller numbers. So we didn't have as enormous impact. Today, we are a species out of reproductive control. There are no controls on our reproduction. So the imbalance between nature and us is enormous. And we are demanding so much of the natural world that I believe very strongly we're at a very precarious point where we are endangering our own existence. Well, it worries me. I mean, I, I look back at, it's not a classic Rousseauian world, but you know, this perfect world, but Rousseau, of course, spoke about our intimacy with the natural world. But as we moved away from something, it, we become dangerous to what we depend on. We, we really don't understand the, the influences of filling the oceans with plastic or polluting the environment or cutting down the forests and so on. So I, I, to me, this is, this is very um, ominous. You know, we are the only creature we know of on this planet, in our solar system, and we don't know anything about life in other parts of the universe. But we're certainly the only creature on this planet that is, is, seems to be dead set on creating its own extinction. It's very important to realize, in terms of evolutionary framework, that there is no goal in mind. You know, natural selection didn't look at Lucy and say, well, we're going to change her and her descendants, and ultimately we're going to evolve into sapiens. Uh, so she lived, her species lived for almost a million years, which meant that uh, they were very successful. All right, that's one way to measure success. Uh, humans are very successful, but the way we measure success is how many of us there are. But Lucy's species went through undoubtedly uh, major changes in climate, which meant that she was a very adaptable species. Okay. Um, today, we are a species that is uh, really um, not thinking about the implications of what we do. Back then, during Lucy's time, it didn't matter if they, if, if, if they did something that disturbed the environment because the environment re responded and recovered very quickly. But today, we are so damaging the environment and never giving it a chance to recover. So for me, this is, this is a very dangerous situation for a species who, who thinks that it is the center of the universe. We think we are, as I say, homo egocentricus. We think we can do anything. And of course, in many countries, and particularly in the United States, we have God who is going to come and save us. We even put his name on our money, that uh, here is God, and, and God we trust. You know, and people say, well, why didn't God help those poor children who were in that bus when the bus was on fire? And, you know, what kind of God is that? And I jokingly say, well, he's, he's too busy helping somebody on the golf course. I, I, oh, please, God, I have to, you know? I mean, it, it's so ridiculous to think that there's some supernatural creature that's going to choose a country, and in my case, particularly America, and come and save us. And, and that puts the responsibility on someone who doesn't even exist when we are the ones who have the responsibility. I think that, that natural history museums are vital. Uh, people say, oh, they're old stuffy museums and they have specimens around that are stuffed in cotton and boxes. And, you know, what are they telling us? What they're telling us is there, there was an enormous variation and variability in animals all over the world. There was a diversity which is gone. It's disappearing. It's shrinking. You know, we've seen species in our own lifetimes that have disappeared. And those are reminders that the sort of grim reaper of evolution, extinction, 
is always there. It's always lurking somewhere. You can't put your finger on it. But as we look at that, the decrease in biodiversity reduces the abilities of natural environments to, to exist. And if it happens so often that there's been extinction, natural history museums remind us that we might even be in trouble ourselves, that we should protect the environment so that the diversity can exist, you know, all of our fellow travelers on this planet, and that perhaps if it happens to that particular bird or that particular primate or that particular um, carnivore, it could happen to us. And in a natural history museum, I think that, that outreach is also very important, that the idea of teaching children the scientific method of, say, collecting butterflies and bringing those, but catching a few of those butterflies and bringing them back and examining them and classifying them into, oh, this butterfly looks like that butterfly, so we'll put those together, gives them a, a very rudimentary introduction to the organization of the natural world, that it is not just chaos, that there is a, a, an organization that runs throughout nature. And when a child catches something alive like that and, and uh, studies it, whether it be with a little lens or under a microscope or writing or drawing a little picture of it or something, that stays with them forever. Uh, and when they go out, and how many birds did you see today? And wh what do you, why do you think that bird's different from that bird? So I think outreach is, is extremely important. And to bring them back to the Natural History Museum, where they can say, oh, well, and wander maybe in a part of the collections and say, oh, that's just like the bird I saw when we were out today, gives them the connection between the Natural History Museum, the natural world, and their openness for new information and being excited about the natural world. Well, as our understanding of how the natural world works increases and we get better at understanding e environmental change, ecological change, implications of those changes, and we talk about changes that are happening today, and we look at specimens in the museum that preserve certain traces of what the world was like a thousand years ago or 500 years ago or 200 years ago. We see the, the increase in, for example, um, greenhouse gases. We see the evidence that the world is getting more and more and more polluted. We see that this was not the case in the past and there will be implications worldwide for this. So, and, and a lot of that information is locked in these specimens for researchers to come and study. So it's terribly important to have those specimens to re-examine in a different light. It's, it's incredible that 44 years after her discovery, there are still scholars, scientists, who have a new problem to solve about anatomy or biomechanics return to the Lucy skeleton and her, all of the specimens of her species to examine them. So new information is being found out about these bones 44 years later. She is an inspiration in her sort of scientific afterlife to new students who want to get involved. Every student I've had in my life comes into my office the first time they meet me and they just say, I read your book, Lucy, and that's why I'm here. And I want to be a paleoanthropologist. And because there are hundreds and hundreds of specimens of her species, it has become the type species, type collection for the study of new discoveries. So she continues to give us information. We've just done scans, uh, you know, micron scans of all the bones now, uh, so we can transmit them and share them with everybody. And we also are beginning to look at trace elements in the bones to see if we have some idea of what she was eating, for example. So uh, who knows what new developments will come along? Who knows uh, what will happen? I mean, Neanderthals were found in 1856. And just uh, 20 years ago, somebody said, well, I wonder if there's DNA in here. 
and they drilled into the arm bone and they found DNA. And if those bones had been destroyed or not cared for or looked after, they would have been gone. And we wouldn't know what Neanderthal DNA looked like. Who knows what methods in the future will enhance even more our understanding of Lucy and her species. Uh, Lucy's been around for 44 years and, and people say, well, what are you going to do next? What's, what's Lucy going to do next? Well, it's a, it's, it's a fascinating answer, one that I never, ever in my wildest dreams would have thought of. NASA is launching a rocket in 2021, and it's called the Lucy Mission. And it will have a picture of Lucy on the outside. And it, as Lucy taught us about the origins of humans, the Lucy Mission is going to go to the asteroids between Mars and Jupiter and examine them for learning more about the origins of our solar system. And what I want to do is put a little, because Lucy, you know, she got her name from a Beatles song, which was Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And what I would like to do is put a couple of little tiny diamonds on that mission so that Lucy will be back in the sky with diamonds. <laughs>